tryptophan, serotonin, and aging. Beginning with the industrial production of glutamic acid, sold as MSG, monosodium glutamate, the public has been systematically misinformed about the effects of amino acids in the diet. The FDA has been industry's powerful ally in misleading the public. Despite research that clearly showed that adults assimilate whole proteins more effectively than free amino acids, much of the public has been led to believe that pre-digested hydrolyzed protein and manufactured free amino acids are more easily assimilated than real proteins, and that they are not toxic. Even if free amino acids could be produced industrially without introducing toxins and allergens, they wouldn't be appropriate for nutritional use. Although some research shows that babies up to the age of 18 months can assimilate free amino acids, a baby formula containing hydrolyzed protein was associated with decreased serum albumin, which suggests that it interfered with protein synthesis. The myth that free amino acids are natural nutritional substances has been used to promote the use of many products besides MSG, including aspartum, chelated minerals, and tryptophan. Although several amino acids can be acutely or chronically toxic, even lethal, when too much is eaten, tryptophan is the only amino acid that is also carcinogenic. It can also produce a variety of toxic metabolites, and it is very susceptible to damage by radiation. Since tryptophan is the precursor of serotonin, the amount of tryptophan in the diet can have important effects on the way the organism responds to stress, and the way it develops, adapts, and ages. When an inflammatory disease, the eosinophilia myalgia syndrome, was noticed in people using tryptophan tablets, there was an intense campaign to exonerate the tryptophan itself by blaming the reaction on an impurity in one company's product. But the syndrome didn't occur only in the people who used that company's product, and similar changes can be produced by a high tryptophan diet. There are people who advocate the use of tryptophan supplementation or other means to increase serotonin in the tissues as a treatment for the fibromyalgia syndrome, but the evidence increasingly suggests that excessive serotonin, interfering with muscle mitochondria, is a major factor in the development of that syndrome. In 1965, Hans Sully showed that the injection of serotonin caused muscular dystrophy. Subsequent studies suggest that serotonin excess is involved in both muscular and nervous dystrophy or degeneration. The fatigue produced by overtraining is probably produced by a tryptophan and serotonin overload, resulting from catabolism of muscle proteins and stress-induced increases in serotonin. Muscle catabolism also releases a large amount of cystin, and cystin, methionine, and tryptophan suppress thyroid function. Stress also liberates free fatty acids from storage, and these fatty acids increase the uptake of tryptophan into the brain, increasing the formation of serotonin. Since serotonin increases ACTH and cortisol secretion, the catabolic state tends to be self-perpetuating. This process is probably a factor influencing the rate of aging and contributing to the physiological peculiarities of aging and depression. Malnutrition, and specifically protein deficiency, produces an inflammatory state that involves extreme serotonin dominance. Stress or malnutrition prenatally or in infancy leads to extreme serotonin dominance in adulthood. Other functions of tryptophan are reduced as more of it is turned into serotonin. Decreasing tryptophan or decreasing serotonin improves learning and alertness, while increased serotonin impairs learning. Tryptophan is an essential amino acid for reproduction and growth of the young animal. Most research on the nutritional requirements for amino acids has been done on farm animals because of the economic incentive to find the cheapest way to produce the fastest growth. Farmers aren't interested in the nutritional factors that would produce the longest-lived pigs. Some research has been done on the amino acid requirements of rats over a significant part of their short lifespans. In rats and farm animals, the amount of tryptophan required decreases with time as the rate of growth slows. In some ways, rats never really mature since they keep growing for nearly their whole lifespan. Their growth stops just a short time before they die, which is usually around the age of two or three years. At this age, rat cells still retain approximately the same high water content seen in the cells of a two-year-old child. They usually become infertile about halfway through their lifespan. If we try to draw conclusions about amino acid requirements from the rat studies, I think we would want to extrapolate the curve for the decreasing need for tryptophan, far beyond the point seen during the rat's short life. And those requirements were determined according to the amounts that produced a maximum rate of growth, using the index of the pig farmers, as if the rats were being studied for possible use as meat. When rats were fed a diet completely lacking tryptophan for a short period, or a diet containing only one-fourth of the normal amount for a more prolonged period, the results were surprising. They kept the ability to reproduce up to the age of 36 months versus 17 months for the rats on the usual diet, and both their average longevity and their maximum longevity increased significantly. They looked and acted like younger rats. A methionine-poor diet also has dramatic longevity-increasing effects. On the tryptophan-poor diet, the amount of serotonin in the brain decreased. When brain serotonin decreases, the level of testosterone in male animals increases. 
More than 20 years ago, a chemical, p-chlorphenylalanine, that inhibits serotonin synthesis, was found to tremendously increase libido. In old age, the amount of serotonin in the brain increases. This undoubtedly is closely related to the relative inability to turn off cortisol production that is characteristic of old age, Sapolsky and Donnelly, 1985. Hypothyroidism increases the formation of serotonin, as does cortisol. In white hair, the amount of tryptophan is higher than in hair of any other color. Although serotonin and tryptophan are very important during rapid growth, their presence in senile tissues is probably closely associated with the processes of decline. The hair loss that occurs in hypothyroidism, postpartum syndrome, and with the use of drugs such as St. John's wort, which can also cause the serotonin syndrome, could be another effect of excess serotonin. Serotonin stimulates cell division, and tends to increase the formation of connective tissue, so its formation should be closely regulated once full growth is achieved. It contributes to the age of stress-related thickening of blood vessels, and other fibrotic processes that impair organ function. The metabolic rate, eating more without gaining extra weight, and ability to regulate body temperature, are increased by early tryptophan deprivation. The ability to oxidize sugar is impaired by serotonin, and several drugs with anti-serotonin actions are being used to treat diabetes and its complications, such as hypertension, obesity, and foot ulcers. An excess of tryptophan early in life, stress, or malnutrition, activates the system for converting tryptophan into serotonin, and that tendency persists into adulthood, modifying pituitary function, and increasing the incidence of pituitary and other cancers. Serotonin's contribution to high blood pressure is well established. It activates the adrenal cortex both directly and through activation of the pituitary. It stimulates the production of both cortisol and aldosterone. It also activates aldosterone secretion by way of the renin-angiotensin system. Angiotensin is an important promoter of inflammation and contributes to the degeneration of blood vessels with aging and stress. It can also promote estrogen production. In the traditional diet, rather than just eating muscle meats, all the animal parts were used. Since collagen makes up about 50% of the protein in an animal and is free of tryptophan. This means that people were getting about half as much tryptophan in proportion to other amino acids when they use foods such as head cheese ox tails and chicken feed. While some of the toxic effects of an excess of individual amino acids have been investigated, and some of the protective or harmful interactions resulting from changing the ratios of the amino acids have been observed. The fact that there are about 20 amino acids in our normal diet means that there is an enormous number of possibilities for harmful or beneficial interactions. The optimal quantity of protein in the diet has traditionally been treated as if it were a matter that could be resolved just by observing the rate of growth when a certain protein is given in certain quantities, along with standard amounts of calories and other nutrients. This kind of research has been useful to farmers who want to find the cheapest foods that will produce the biggest animals in the shortest time. But that kind of research climate has spread a degraded concept of nutrition into the culture at large, influencing medical ideas of nutrition, the attitudes of consumers, and the policies of governmental regulatory agencies. When synthetic amino acids are used to supplement natural proteins, they are usually chosen according to irrelevant models of the ideal protein's composition, and many toxic contaminants are invariably present in the synthetic free amino acids. For the present, the important thing is to avoid the use of the least appropriate food products, while choosing natural foods that have historical, epidemiological, and biochemical justification. Whey has been promoted as a protein supplement, but it contains a slightly higher proportion of tryptophan than milk does. Cheese, milk with the whey removed, contains less tryptophan. Some people have been encouraged to eat only the whites of eggs, to avoid cholesterol, but the egg albumin is rich in tryptophan. The expensive tender cuts of meat contain excessive amounts of cystin and tryptophan, but bone broth and the tougher cuts of meat contain more gelatin, which lacks those amino acids. Many fruits are deficient in tryptophan, yet have very significant quantities of the other amino acids. They also contain some of the carbon skeleton, keto acid, equivalents of the essential amino acids, which can be converted to protein in the body. Serotonin in excess produces a broad range of harmful effects. Cancer, inflammation, fibrosis, neurological damage, shock, bronchoconstriction, and hypertension, for example. Increased serotonin impairs learning, serotonin antagonists improve it. The simplest, non-essential, amino acid, glycine, has been found to protect against carcinogenesis, inflammation, fibrosis, neurological damage, shock, asthma, and hypertension. Increased glycine improves learning, Handlemann, et al., 1989, Feil, et al., 1999, glycine antagonists usually impaired. Its antitoxic and cytoprotective actions are remarkable. Collagen, besides being free of tryptophan, contains a large amount of glycine 32% of its amino acid units, 22% of its weight. The varied anti-inflammatory and protective effects of glycine can be thought of as an anti-serotonin action. For example, serotonin increases the formation of TNF, tumor necrosis factor, also called cachectin, glycine inhibits it. 
In some situations, glycine is known to suppress the formation of serotonin. Antagonists of serotonin can potentiate glycine's effects. People who ate traditional diets, besides getting a lower concentration of tryptophan, were getting a large amount of glycine in their gelatin rich diet. Gelatin, besides being a good source of glycine, also contains a large amount of proline, which has some anti oxidatory properties similar to glycine. If a half pound of steak is eaten, it would probably be reasonable to have about 20 grams of gelatin at approximately the same time. Even a higher ratio of gelatin to muscle meat might be preferable. Carbon dioxide, high altitude, thyroid, progesterone, caffeine, aspirin, and decreased tryptophan consumption protect against excessive serotonin release. When sodium intake is restricted, there is a sharp increase in serotonin secretion. This accounts for some of the anti-inflammatory and diuretic effects of increased sodium consumption. Increasing sodium lowers both serotonin and adrenaline. The polyunsaturated oils interact closely with serotonin and tryptophan, and the short and medium chain saturated fatty acids have antihistamine and antiserotonin actions. Serotonin liberates free fatty acids from the tissues, especially the polyunsaturated fats, and these in turn liberate serotonin from cells such as the platelets, and liberate tryptophan from serum albumin, increasing its uptake and the formation of serotonin in the brain. Saturated fats don't liberate serotonin, and some of them, such as capric acid found in coconut oil, relax blood vessels, while linoleic acid constricts blood vessels and promotes hypertension. Stress, exercise, and darkness increase the release of free fatty acids and so promote the liberation of tryptophan and formation of serotonin. Increased serum linoleic acid is specifically associated with serotonin-dependent disorders such as migraine. Coconut oil, because of the saturated fatty acids of varied chain length and its low linoleic acid content, should be considered as part of a protective diet. In the collagen theory of aging, it is argued that changes in the extracellular matrix are responsible for isolating cells from their environment, reducing the availability of nutrients and oxygen, and reducing their ability to send and receive the chemical signals that are needed for correct adaptive functioning. In diabetes, basement membranes are thickened, and in a given volume of tissue there are fewer capillaries. This effect probably involves excessive serotonin. Old animals contain a higher proportion of collagen. All tendons, or tendons that have been exposed to excessive estrogen and diseases such as carcinoid, in which very large amounts of serotonin are released systemically, fibrosis is exaggerated, and may be the direct cause of death. Radiation and oxygen deprivation also lead to increased tissue fibrosis. In specific fibrotic conditions, such as cirrhosis of the liver, it is known that glycine and saturated fats can reverse the fibrosis. In fibrosis of the heart, thyroid hormone is sometimes able to reverse the condition. I think these facts imply that excessive tryptophan, estrogen, and polyunsaturated fats contribute significantly, maybe decisively, to the degenerative changes that occur in aging. Experiments have separately shown that reducing dietary tryptophan or unsaturated fats can extend the healthy lifespan, and several anti-estrogenic interventions, removal of the pituitary, or supplementing with progesterone, can slow age-related changes and delay degenerative diseases. Since these factors interact, each tending to promote the others, and also interact with exogenous toxins, excess iron accumulation, and other stressors, it would be reasonable to expect greater results when several of the problems are corrected at the same time.